2009, the School of Journalism sent a wonderful group of young people from our journalism program across country. And among that group that's over my shoulder right now is this wonderful lady, Angela Hughes. Angela, good to see you again. It's so great seeing you after all these years, Professor Rucker. Thank you. And I always tell everybody, you look younger and I look older and I'm older. <laughs> so tell me what you've been doing since graduation. Oh, I've done so much. Um, since graduation from the Journalism Mass Communications Department at San Jose State, um, I took a year off um, after graduation and moved east to New York City, where I attended grad school, grad school at the, um, the new school in New York City, uh, where I studied media studies with an emphasis in international affairs. Um, I actually was really inspired by the trip when we made a stop in um, Atlanta at CNN's headquarters. Um, and that really motivated me to become a news reporter. And so uh, I began my career as a um, story coordinator for Inside Edition, the TV show, if you're familiar. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I went on to do a few stories as a video journalist for the New York Post, and then eventually had a very short-lived career, but a career nonetheless, um, as a field news reporter for News 12 in the Bronx. Wow, very impressive. Yeah. yeah. And, then, and then you found your way back to the West Coast. So I came back to the West Coast um, and I actually transitioned from broadcast media into public relations, communications and, and uh, marketing where I work primarily with government agencies um, and, um, and just in the public sector in general, uh, helping uh, push forward uh, communications plans and uh, just supporting uh, the work um, to be of service to the public. You know, it's amazing. If I remember correctly, you were an advertising major in our program? Yes, I was an advertising major. Uh, I've always loved writing, always loved writing. And um, I was actually studying to become a copywriter in, in advertising. I remember that. So you've covered all the fields. PR now, done journalism, done advertising. You're going to have to run for president next, okay? <laughs> now, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about the trip itself. What are your fondest memories or most powerful memories of when this group went across country to the inauguration? I would say that my fondest memory, um, aside from just getting to know all these other incredible students uh, that I embarked on this amazing journey with, um, was sitting at the Woolworth counter um, in North Carolina, in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, at that point in the trip, we were kind of reaching the tail end of the trip uh, prior to the inauguration in Washington, DC. Um, and we had spent pretty much the, previous week or the past week, um, visiting all of these historic landmarks um, that were prominent in African American civil rights history here in the United States. And it, there was kind of a buildup, you know, you experience all these uh, places and seeing all these sites that had just such a, that were the sites of, of so much history. And for us to actually sit at that counter and know that there were people you know, decades, a couple decades before us that sat at those seats and they sacrificed and they went through so much to make sure that not only myself, but, you know, my niece and my nephews and, and future generations could have the freedoms that we do. Um, it really hit me at that point. And I cried like a baby. <laughs> but to just know that I'm standing on the shoulders of leaders of pioneers of uh, strength and resiliency um, was just really something that has stuck with me ever since and it'll stick with me for the remainder of my life for sure. Very good and certainly you brought those experiences into your career and into your life. Talk to me now about the year 2020 where we are and certainly what's been happening since the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis. Yes I think that um, you know, on one hand, I see what we are dealing with now as a country, as a society, um, as something where it's a marker of our lack of progress, right? It's like, oh, we're protesting the same things, the same injustices uh, that we once did, you know, that we learned about and experienced during our trip in 2009. Um, but then on the other hand, I my, one of my personal beliefs is that if you continue to go through certain experiences, that means that the lesson hasn't been learned yet. 
And I think that we are at a pivotal point in our society and as a humanity, as people, as a country, where we're now starting to see why it's still happening, rather than acknowledging that it's happening, that racism still exists, uh, that structural racism, all kinds of racism exists, um, uh, and prejudice against people of color, against Black folks, of Black people. Um, we're now looking underneath that surface and we're looking at, well, what has caused this? I think a lot of people are taking a, a look inward instead of looking at the structures that have upheld racism. Uh, people are starting to look at themselves and they're starting to look at some of their implicit biases that they didn't realize they had before. Um, and I think that um, this is an exciting time. I know a lot of people are like, exciting, what do you mean? Um, I think it's an exciting time because when you begin to acknowledge where those issues are, then that's the very first step to healing. And so um, to me, there are definitely differences between, uh, dif differences between now and the civil rights movement, uh, but there are definitely uh, you know, some similarities too. And people keep wondering, will we be able to sustain the energy during 2020 and beyond to make sure there is permanent changes for the better for African Americans and all people of color. But let me tap into your advertising background. Recently, before this taping, we heard about PepsiCo announcing that they were going to get rid of the Aunt Jemima label, a famous label, pancakes and syrup and all the products that had that name on it because they felt this was the moment to do that. My question for you is, why didn't they do it sooner? And do you really think this gesture combined with other corporate gestures is all that we need? Um, to that, I would say um, the reason people are acknowledging that it's problematic, something like Aunt Jemima is problematic now is because people are pointing it out. People are shedding more light on it. People are speaking up about it more uh, than before. And I think that um, that also speaks to the importance of having um, allies and people who are not Black speaking up on our behalf and speaking up for us as well. That's really helped shed light on how problematic it is. Um, I think that on one hand, I do feel like there's, um, there's kind of this like, a lot of businesses and corporations feel like um, they need to kind of hop on the train, if you will, hop on this like Black Lives Matter, we support our Black people um, kind of movement or train or trend um, because they're trying to reach their bottom line. But in reality, they have to understand that a lot of their, um, a lot of their revenue is due to Black dollars, Black support. Um, and so they have to acknowledge, and again, I think it's just one small piece of that larger, um, sorry, my mom's phone. Uh, I believe that it's one small piece of that larger um, uh, issues of, the, of that larger solution that I'm talking, that I said uh, a few minutes ago of how um, we're now looking inward. We're now looking under the rug at all of those issues that we've swept under the rug for so many years. And um, all of these things combined contribute to the perpetuation of uh, negative views of African-Americans um, and to racism and to the implicit bias that a lot of people don't believe, you know, are not aware that they have. Um, when you make these very small changes or seemingly small changes, when you add them up, it, it, it really has helped perpetuate these ideas. And so even though it may seem like something small, you know, like changing the name of a sports team or changing the name of a, an elementary school, um, a lot of those things do mean something. Very good, and you mentioned sports. I was thinking in our news right now in 2020, as we're sitting here, we're hearing the National Football League making plans to come back from COVID-19, the pandemic of this year, which has pretty much ground this nation to a halt, has uh, damaged our economy, certainly has uh, put people out of work for a significant amount of time. It makes me wonder, in 2020, are we really able to focus so heavily on racial equality when we're trying to deal with a pandemic, we're trying to deal with our livelihoods, keeping our families safe? Is it possible we could get lost in the shuffle? Um, I think that uh, the way that people, certain people are impacted by the global pandemic is directly related to our struggles with racism in this country. 
Uh, I think that, you know, we've seen time and time again, especially in the media, that the African American community is most disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. And then when you peel back those layers and you again lifting the rug and you see under that rug, there are there's healthcare disparity. There's uh, experimentation, you know, history of, of experimentation of uh, black people in this country. There's a history of uh, neglect of black patients. Uh, there's there's just so many underlying issues when it comes to healthcare and black people. And I think that um, they may seem like they are separate things, like dealing with the global pandemic and and then dealing with racism, discrimination against black people and people of color, um, but. we have to acknowledge that the reason that the number is high again is because of the issues in the healthcare system when it comes to black people the lack of resources when it comes to healthcare and people being treated for covid-19 the lack of information the lack of outreach and that's where i come in as a, a communications professional working in the public sector is a lot of times just for example if i'm working on a project uh, for a client or an employer that has to do with air pollution in a uh, community that's most impacted by air pollution, a lot of times they are not using, um, they are not communicating to that target community in a way where they can understand to help come to a solution. And similarly with the pandemic, we have to educate or the powers that be or those who are in the position to do so have to provide information and provide the services and the resources required to address these disparities in the African American community and in impoverished communities um, so that people can get the help that they need. And so I think that, um, you know, they say that we have, we're adjusting to a new normal, but that's because the old normal, and I'm sure everyone has seen this time and time again throughout the last couple months, the old normal was not normal and the old normal was not working because there were too many people being left behind. There were too many people being ignored, namely and specifically uh, the black community. And I think that uh, again, these go hand in hand and it's important for us to uh, be able to acknowledge both of those things and not only acknowledge them, but to be proactive and work towards a solution. And very quickly before we're done, a lot of our colleagues still at San Jose State who are African, American faculty and staff are saying that they're getting a lot of contacts in 2020, phone calls, emails, texts, asking them, how do I help? What do I do? I don't understand. How do I explain what's going on? What do you think about the notion of it's a black community responsibility to educate people and take the time and be patient and say it like it is? Well, if I could be candid here, it is not my job as a black woman to educate a white person or uh, any other race about uh, racism and discrimination against black people. Um, I think that there, uh, people know that it exists. People know that we have experienced this for generations, um, but people have decided to ignore it. And so I think to make it easier for them to understand. They want us to interpret in some sort of way. But I think that um, just self-education, right? Self-education, there are tons of books. Uh, you know, YouTube is a fantastic source where this video will be posted. Um, there are documentaries, there are movies. I mean, there's, there's a plethora of, of, of sources of information for people to access, uh, to educate themselves on uh, the difficulties and the challenges of living in a society that is uh, that targets you directly, that does not treat you with the respect that they would treat another race. Um, the other thing I would say is, uh, again, people have to do that inner work. They have to take a step back and ask themselves, "Am I a racist?" I mean, just very plainly, you know. Or, or even if you don't want to necessarily use that word. Um, you know, what are some of the things that I'm doing that helps perpetuate these ideas? Or how do I feel when I am walking past a, a group of young Black teens? Or how do I feel when I'm, you know, someone walks into the room? How do I feel towards my Black coworker? You know, so just asking people uh, to look within themselves and kind of do this introspective look at 
some of their behaviors and, and parts of their mentality that help um, perpetuate um, racism. Um, it isn't my job, but I, I believe that myself um, and many other Black people, really, but I can only speak for myself, um, are, are very open and willing to helping educate people, but I will not resume responsibility for educating people when we have so much information at our at our fingertips. Very well said, and I want to thank you for being a part of this. Pretty soon we're going to get the whole group together to continue this conversation. Sounds like in Sacramento you are really making headway. Congratulations <laughs> on your career. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> we're very proud of you and all the members of this team that really put San Jose State on the map in 2009. Thank you so much, Angela. Thank you, Professor.